these are hard days. It's been a hard summer uh, for us. We look at our world as citizens. We look out on the world as individuals. We look at our own circumstances and we look out in the world as Christians, as members of Christ's church. We've seen forest fires destroying whole communities, and we wonder what this means for the future of our country, and indeed we worry for the whole planet. The war in Ukraine grinds on as it does in Sudan. The church itself is facing persecution. I recently received reports about Christians who had been kidnapped from their communities and held for ransom because they had changed their faith. And this was an offense to their families and to their communities. So the church is facing persecution. It's the policy of one of the major global states to target Muslim and Christian communities. And our next door neighbor, not everywhere, but to a dangerous degree, has become to a dangerous extent not the Church of Jesus Christ, but effectively a political party. A betrayal of Jesus' words to Pilate that my kingdom is not of this world. Or we listen to the nature of the political dialogue in our own country, and we worry about where things are going. I'm not talking here about the legitimacy of different opinions, but we do worry about the nature of political dialogue in our world and in our country. And I don't want to generalize, but how we engage with each other is another thing that gives us concern, and we worry about where things are going. And then there are the burdens that we carry as individuals and as families and as friends where does all that leave you? We can easily be left in a place of despair. And so this morning, I'm asking the question, how does the Christian deal with despair? As always, there are many things that are helpful within the Christian's community and personal discipleship. Prayer is obvious. We think of that well-tested hymn over the ages. What a friend we have in Jesus. Take it to the Lord in prayer. Fellowship is invaluable for drawing on the lived experience of brothers and sisters. And it's a practical remedy for loneliness and discouragement. Gratitude is often overlooked as a remedy for despair. It's one of the lessons of the Psalms, how frequently the psalmist turns to the Lord, thanking him for his goodness and mercies in the past. Have you noticed how many of the Psalms combine profound discouragement with exuberant praise? How is that possible? It's because David and other psalmists have learned the lesson, the secret of gratitude in dealing with despair. And closely tied to that is worship. Much of the content of the psalms is recorded in the darkness of the night when despair does its work. And the psalmist refuses to give in but responds with the affirmation of the essential goodness and sovereignty and mercy of Almighty God. 
important and practical as these remedies for despair are, I want you to come with me this morning to Peter's first letter to the early church, to early Christians, who, like many of our brothers and sisters alive around the world today, had every reason for despair. What was Peter's counsel to them? Logically and practically, the antidote to despair is hope. Hope is the opposite of despair. So it follows that the antidote to despair is hope. And what is the basis for hope? Peter makes the case that our hope is based on the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Hope is personal. You have been given a new birth through faith in Jesus. Remember Jesus' conversation with Nicodemus. He told Nicodemus that the secret to eternal life is this birth from above. It's not a physical birth. It's a spiritual thing that happens. It's a birth from above. That's why Jesus described it to Nicodemus that way in the context of the kingdom of God. And here Peter describes it as an inheritance. But it's a present reality as well as a future one. Heaven here that Peter describes does not mean some faraway place where we will go when we die. But it's also a present reality. Of course, heaven is in the future, but it is also now. It means the kingdom of God. And that inheritance that Peter refers to is God's power at work here and now, as well as in the future at the coming of the Lord Jesus. That's why Jesus spoke to the people of his day. It's why he spoke to the crowds, to his disciples, of the kingdom of heaven as being within you, near you, among you. It is God at work here and now, wherever his reach extends. And that sovereign reach extends to the places touched by despair. I'm not saying that God is going to fix everything and make the things that distress us go away, although he could. And one day he will put everything right. There will be justice, there will be truth, there will be relief. And that is why we pray, your kingdom come. The cosmos will know that Jesus, the Savior, has returned to take his throne with glory and power and praise. And we, the church, rejoice at that prospect. Even though for a little while, says Peter, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials. Because of the resurrection, we have hope. And we trust that that hope will be validated. Maybe the image is cashed in. Peter speaks of an inheritance, that inheritance that we will be able to claim, to cash in at Jesus' coming in glory. 
Now, Peter is honest in addressing a practical problem of faith that those early Christians must have faced. And cynics today face it. And maybe some of you face it. We have never seen Jesus. We've never met him. And even though we don't see him now, says Peter, you believe in him and you're filled with an inexpressible and glorious joy for you're receiving the end result of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Writing this, Peter surely must have had in mind his friend and fellow disciple Thomas in mind. Unless I put my hand in the wounds and see his wounds, I won't believe, said Thomas. And Jesus replied, when that did happen, you have seen Thomas and you've believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and have believed. For my part, I believe in the resurrection of Jesus from the dead, and I hope you do too. I'm convinced that the facts and the logic of history attest to Jesus' resurrection. And if true, it is the basis for hope and no matter what trials, it is the antidote to despair. Meanwhile, as we look at the world and our own place in it, what should be our position before God? What was Peter's counsel to his flock? You remember Jesus' mandate to Peter was feed my lambs. This morning, we are Jesus' lambs. How is Peter feeding us from his counsel in this letter? What is he saying to us today if we find ourselves prone to despair? Humble yourselves, therefore, under God's mighty hand that he may lift you up in due time says Peter in chapter 5, verses 6 and 7. I've noticed that in the church, we tend to focus on the cheerful bits of God's promises. And by all means, we should take seriously and take to the Lord his promises. But we should learn not just from the cheerful bits of God's word, but from the whole counsel of the scriptures. We tend to quote verse 6 more often. For he will lift you up. And we say, casting all your cares on him because he cares for you. And that is absolutely true. But how often do we say to ourselves and to each other, humble yourselves under God's almighty hand? Another way of expressing humble yourselves under God's mighty hand is your will be done. Your will be done is hard to learn, but it is the example and the situation of our master himself. And it needs to be in our experience. It was at the heart of Jesus' experience. Remember Gethsemane. If it be possible, he prayed, 
take this cup from me, but not my will, but yours be done. He humbled himself under God's mighty hand for us, for me, for you. And Peter is now telling us, we too must learn to humble ourselves under God's mighty hand. And then, God raised him from the dead. Through his resurrection, we are born again to a new and living hope, the power of God at work here and now. and in the future, and that is our antidote to despair. The power and triumph of that resurrection, the defeat of death and evil itself will result in inexpressible glory at Jesus' revelation at the last time. And that is worth looking forward to. And I'm putting it far too mildly. But while that power is at work in us, that too is an antidote to despair. Peter makes it clear that one result of our passage through trials and suffering will be the refinement of our faith that will be more precious than gold and it will result in praise and glory to Jesus Christ. What might seem to despair to you today, the suffering, the trials that if necessary, you're called to go through. God at work at you results here and now in praise and glory to Jesus Christ. The cosmos is looking on and they see the result, the refinement of your faith in Jesus. And that results in praise and glory to him. And we too will be lifted up after we have submitted to God's will. The lived reality of the church through the ages. Meanwhile, by all means, cast your anxieties on him because he cares for us. That too is how we deal with despair. So let us encourage one another with words of hope grounded on the reality of the resurrection of Jesus from the dead in whom we have new life and an inheritance kept for us that can never spoil away. In the church, we are often impatient. We want God to act now. And meet our wishes now. He alone knows when Jesus will return. And he calls on us to be patient and to trust him to lift us up, but submit to him and believe and trust him that he will do it in due time, not later than we can bear, 
and not earlier than will be to the glory of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Submit to him to do it in due time, trusting that our inheritance is being kept in heaven for us for that day of Jesus' return and at work here and now. So brothers and sisters, do not despair. Join me in prayer. We thank you, almighty God, that Jesus did not despair, but for the joy of the glory set before him, endured the cross for us. He submitted, he humbled himself under your mighty hand, knowing that in due time you would lift him up. And he did this that we might be born to a new and living hope. Help us, O God, this day and every day of our lives to trust in you that a glorious inheritance is being kept in heaven for us and so endure if you call us to suffer various trials knowing that we have been born to a new and glorious hope and an inheritance that is being kept in heaven for us. We pray this for our brothers and sisters around the world who are being asked to go through various trials. Stand with them, we pray, almighty God. Lift them up as well in due time. And we await that day, unknown to us, when Jesus will return. Keep us faithful and loyal to him, that we, with the cosmos and with the church everywhere, will rejoice at his coming and will join with him in praise and glory. We ask this this morning through that same Lord Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, in whose name and by whose name alone we pray. Amen.